Hello, I'm James Dagonixon. Welcome to the ACS's Reimagination Thought Leaders Summit. Now, the summit today has brought together leaders from a range of industries and sectors, be it technology, education and health, as well as politics. And they are all here to discuss the challenges, the opportunities, sharing insights around well, the rapidly changing technology that is impacting economies right around the world. The digital age, if you like. Now, as I made mention, one of the spheres here of influence is the political realm. Uh, we had a couple of politicians on both sides of the fence talking about their perspective when it comes to some of this change that is having a big, big impact. Now, the Nationals Senator uh, was here in the form of Bridget McKenzie, and I spoke to her about a number of issues. To begin with, though, of course, in a somewhat timely announcement, the large-scale 50,000-person data breach that the government admitted to this morning. Look, need to get your thoughts on the, um, the revelations this morning around the, the data breach. And mm. of course, coming not that long at all, just a few weeks from the, the Medicare issues, it's not a good look for the government. Look, I think the government's acted really swiftly in response to being notified that an external contractor with several of government agencies had experienced a data breach and some sensitive information had found its way online. Uh, the Australian Cyber Security Centre acted swiftly, uh, plugged the breach, working with that agency to ensure uh, that it's removed the vulnerability and we can be confident that that's occurred and the agencies are now working with affected staff to ensure a really positive outcome. So I think it shows that the Australian Cyber Security Centre is working and that we need to ensure that all SMEs right throughout our economy are aware of the risks to, uh, and the vulnerabilities that are out there with respect to cyber security. How does this happen though? I mean, with all the, all the focus from the government, rightly so, in, in terms of breaches, be it cyber security or whether it be human error, which seems to be the case uh, this time, how does this, this happen from the government's perspective, particularly just a, a number of weeks after a previous breach? Well, I think we've always got to be vigilant. And I think, once again, it highlights that right throughout the supply chain of services to government, we interact with not only government agencies who are well aware of the cyber security risks, but indeed SMEs right throughout our communities that may have less understanding of the vulnerabilities that exist for them and the uh, probably the diligence and the focus of those who would seek to do them harm mm. uh, have on actually interacting with them. I think SMEs need to update their uh, policies and procedures mm. to ensure that their staff are very, very aware of the very real risk of seeing private information of individuals uh, on the internet, which is, uh, you know, a significant concern. But I think we've acted swiftly, uh, removed the vulnerability, and hopefully we can all learn from this and move on. Because this was a huge breach. I mean, this is 50,000 uh, people, personal details, credit card numbers in, in some cases. This wasn't a, a small breach by, by any, any uh, stretch of the imagination. Well, all the credit card details that were released uh, were not actually for current cards, so they're whilst it was not a great look that it was online, uh, there wasn't actually material damage that could have occurred through the breach itself. So the, the affected agencies are working with their staff right now uh, to overcome any issues. Can I get your thoughts on something else as well? I mean, we're here today talking about uh, the impact of innovation, impact mm. of technology on our lives, on the workforce. And today, National Australia Bank, one of the biggest employers um, in the country, announcing 6,000 jobs to go as a result of you know, um, embracing the, the digital economy. Yeah, and I think it's a great tragedy when anybody in our community loses their job. And I think we have to look back, this isn't the first time that banks en masse mm. have adopted uh, innovation and technology that's resulted in significant job losses. If you look at the decade between 1995 and 2005, we saw over 50,000 bank tellers lose their jobs because we all embraced, embraced ATMs. And, and now you can't imagine uh, yeah. having to go into a bank between 9 and 4.30 and actually get your cash out for the weekend. Uh, it actually wouldn't work in today's society. So I think we've evolved. Uh, the good news is, is that whilst this, as traumatic as this particular 
uh, instance is that technology does actually see job growth throughout the economy and uh, I'm confident that whilst the tragedy of this uh, for these individuals will be also met in other opportunities coming throughout the economy by the adoption of new technologies. So long as those people are reskilled, I mean that's that's well, certainly absolutely. got to be the bridge, doesn't it? And I think that's another great innovation and change in our education system over the last mm. two decades. If I think when I left left school in the late 80s, you had one pathway and one pathway only. Whereas now we see that you can dip in and out of our tertiary education, our vocational education system as you need and mm. as your, your needs change throughout your life cycle. So I think that's a really important change that's occurred within our education system that will allow these workers to rechain and reskill and hopefully find a really meaningful employment in the near future. Can we talk about regional Australia, something mm. very close to, to your heart. Um, in particular, there's so much focus around technology advances, innovation, you know, startups, hubs and so forth. A lot of the focus tends to be on the major cities. That's right. What about regional <laughs> Australia? Well, I think if you if you look at what drives a startup culture and an innovative culture, it's about a, a spirit of entrepreneurialism mm. and cre creativity. And I think if you look at all the great inventions, you know, from the Sunshine Harvester uh, way back in the day uh, to the setting up of the CSIRO back mm. in the 20s was as a National Party minister. Earl Page. So I think science and the adoption of technology has been at the heart of our agricultural industries and the resilience that's required to grow and prosper in the regions uh, because of that tyranny of distance means we have that entrepreneurial spirit. What we're lacking is the infrastructure mm. uh, to actually enable and enact uh, that already existent spirit of entrepreneurialism and creativity. So I think we need to be really focused on ensuring that the investment in infrastructure is happening across the regions and that's why I'm really proud of what our government's been able to achieve. Set over 760 mobile phone towers in rounds one and two with more to come. We've focused the MBN on where there isn't access to broadband rather than rolling it out in capital cities to allow more competition. So I think fundamental changes like that from our government mean that regional Australia is getting access uh, to infrastructure more quickly. But I, I take your point, I think there's some really great things happening in regional capitals where we could get that sort of ecosystem happening. Uh, how, do you, how do you build that further? I mean, do you look at incentives or do you think purely by putting in the infrastructure that allows that to grow organically, it'll naturally happen? What I was trying to say, like, I think naturally these, our communities are creative. Yeah entrepreneurial, we are innovators, we are inventors and we always have been because of necessity, right? The yep. environment we yep. live in uh, necessitates that fact as, as, as a group of people. So what we need now to enable that to be brought into the 21st century so we can take up all the opportunities that exist but also overcome a lot of the challenges means that infrastructure has to be available. I think we naturally have the other requisite uh, facets to set up a, a, an ecosystem such as the um, innovation hubs that exist in capital cities. Because the worry would be that regional Australia, parts of it, not all of it, certainly mm. you get the, the major regional centres, might be left behind. And that, that would be the concern, particularly from a Absolutely. viewpoint within that. They say, well, what about me? All of this is happening, but what about me? Well, we've got a, an agricultural boom. We've got a 75% yeah. increase in uh, food consumption over coming decades. I mean, we've got a $60 billion industry sitting there uh, with very few people running the place. But when you look at what young farmers are doing in terms of adoption of technology, the Internet of Things on farm, it's uh, quite exciting when we look at the productivity gains that we'll be able to make because I guess the restructuring of agricultural industries in the 1980s mm. uh, meant that really now the Productivity Commission found this a couple of years ago that the only productivity gains through agriculture that we'll be able to make are through the adoption of technology. So I think it's essential for us to actually deliver on the promise that regional Australia brings. I can see it already happening out there in the regions and I think the faster we roll that infrastructure out uh, they're dying and rearing to go to take advantage of it and build their businesses. Now also speaking here today as part of a, a panel was the Shadow Minister for the Digital Economy, Ed Husick. I sat down with him a short time ago and again started by asking about the data breach. And this is a serious and dramatic event. Uh, no one should uh, underplay how big a deal this is. 50,000 records breached. Some of the data that has been revealed 
uh, including passwords and credit card details, um, really serious. Um, it's really hard, I think, for the government to tell business and the broader community they've got to get their act together on cyber security when they can't demonstrate a similar degree of seriousness themselves. But this was a contract, it wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't the government itself, it was a third party which they're pointing to. Look, the buck stops somewhere and if you've got a contractor and you're, um, you've allowed them access to sensitive data, um, you should expect rightly that um, that data is protected um, because ultimately you'll be held responsible for it. Again, there's a degree of moral authority that's been sapped from the government in seeing this happen, um, seeing a similar event happen recently with defence subcontractors, and then on top of that, the Medicare data breach. This has all happened in a constrained, tight period of time, um, and they are serious issues. And the other thing that I've got a problem with, James, is this. Uh, we found out about this um, through the media you know, some weeks after it had been first reported to the government. Why wasn't the government up front? This is a government that hides details, hides bad news, hoping it won't come out, when rather they should just be up front and say what happened and what's been done to fix it. But they were up front with those that had been impacted, from what I understand, in terms of the breach. So surely that's their responsibility, to make sure that those that are impacted are aware and the issues remedied. Well, I think uh, being upfront does the other thing as well. It might be one thing to talk um, to the employees and the people affected. Tick, right? That's the right thing. They should have done it. Um, the bigger thing is um, shining a light on, uh, by way of a, a case study or an example effect, which um, sends a signal to others. They have to treat this seriously. The data um, just can't be left, you know, uh, open or accessible uh, to people in a way that's not you know, sanctioned. So I think there's a big, like I said, you know, from a formal um, opposition uh, perspective, um, we think this is a serious issue and we'll be demanding a briefing on what exactly has happened and what's been done to fix it. Yep. Other issue, and just finally on this, seems to be, you know, the last couple of cases, this included, seems to almost be, I don't want to say lazy, but I mean, a mistake as opposed mm. to, you know, an aggressive targeted attack. So it's one thing to be able to have the right defences in place against you know external threats, but how do you how do you how do you ward against human error? Yeah, and this is the point, and it's well known within um, you know when you think about cyber and you think about the whole issue of cyber security itself. Uh, more often than not, it's not the tech that lets you down; it's the people and the processes. Um, but it's human error uh, that is largely responsible uh, for these things, and it seems at this point this is exactly the same thing, and so. You know, that's why I say you know, these type of things should be made a public example to reinforce in the minds of people that are dealing with data that they have to be very careful with how they're managing it. Now, Ed Husek, one of the other things you've been very vocal about in, in recent times is uh, the impact uh, technology is having on the workplace mm. and it's certainly a very topical issue at the moment. Indeed, this morning, um, I'm sure you've probably heard National Australia Bank today announcing mm. some 6,000 jobs yep. uh, to go as a result of the, the digitisation, the continued um, embracing of technology for uh, for their operations uh, they say they're going to bring in 2,000 jobs but that's a different skill set yeah this is this is something that from apparently we're going to continue to see yeah and they're not the first bank James to announce I mean there have been others uh, that I know well that are either publicly mm. or I know privately have scoped out what they how they will use technology to improve their operations uh, and what the likely job impacts are um, some of them have been thinking carefully, to their great credit, about how to manage that change process. I think this is really important. Uh, but my bigger concern is I don't think, uh, in terms of as a broader community, we're applying enough thought, planning in advance, um, about what impact technology will have on jobs. And I think it's also careful, too, to make this point, not to look at technology in a negative light. You know, businesses are always looking at ways to improve the way they work. They need to be encouraged to do this, um, but they also need to be encouraged to think longer term. And that point you made about retraining um, is the biggest thing in that long-term thinking that needs to happen. Because as you rightly point out, 6,000 jobs might go, 2,000 might be created. Can people with the skill sets in that 6,000 neatly fit? That's a big question mark. And what needs to be done to lift them into the skill set 
so that they can then be considered for those 2,000. I think that's a really big thing. So how do you approach it? I mean, you're the, the shadow minister for the digital mm. economy. How do you propose from a, uh, a regulatory or a legislative perspective to, to help smooth out the transition? Because there are going to be winners and losers. Yeah, sure. And you know, I, I um, am not necessarily one to reach for the regulatory lever here. Uh, I think it should be something that we work out in a collaborative way, mm. because once you go to a regulatory switch, it's you know, more likely you're doing it against someone's will, so to speak. <laughs> Um, but this is businesses quite a lot. If you don't think in advance about this and you play catch up with your overseas rivals to mm. apply technology and then you um, basically shift a large number of people out into the jobless queues, you know, the community disquiet that will be created by that will be the perfect climate for a regulatory response that is um, short term thinking rather than long term benefit. So for business, I'll often say get ahead of this and we can avoid the regulatory imposition um, because you know you, when you have Bill Gates, for example, arguing for a robot tax, yeah. that's designed to jab the ribs of business leaders to go, well, if you don't, this is what you're facing. Um, longer term, I think you know, there are three cohorts of people we need to consider. Obviously, the next generation coming through and how they're skilled up, the generation that are in the workplace now and will be affected, and also the ones that are likely to have, you know, notionally should have retired, mm. but still want to maintain a connection. And they all have varying needs in terms of, you know, preparing skills or refreshing skills. And governments at all levels, and importantly business in terms of workforce development, needs to think collaboratively about how to bring that work so together. Okay, we are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get the thoughts of business when it comes to all this digital disruption. Stay with us. Hi there, welcome back to the program. Before the break, we were hearing well, the political viewpoint, if you like, when it comes to this digital disruption. Time now to hear from business. And I'm pleased to say we spoke a little bit earlier to Sarah Adam Gedge. She's the CEO of Avenard Australia, essentially a company focused on business technology solutions and critically taking a big look at artificial intelligence. And that's where the conversation began. Well, uh, it's a great uh, topic, James. Uh, I have just come from Gartner. The underlying theme has been artificial intelligence, and then we use that as an umbrella phrase mm. for a lot of the newer technology, machine learning, IoT, chatbots, a lot of those types of newer technologies that are underneath that. And the opportunities are vast, and for Australia, for the organisations in Australia, for people working around being far more involved in things that can actually help us become more productive in our businesses, uh, but also can contribute to far greater outcomes. So if you think of health and you think if you can get greater insights into how you might cure a disease, uh, and that, that's great for all of us as a nation, it's great for us as individuals. That's the one that everybody talks about That's right. and um, wouldn't it be great if we had a situation where there was no road rage, no speeding, no driving under the influence and if you did happen to have an accident, which would be a lot rarer, you'd probably get help a little bit sooner. So uh, the opportunities are vast. If I then reflected on productivity mm. for uh, Australia, for organisations here, We've done a study globally that's actually had a look at how leaders feel about productivity. Does AI help their organisations be more productive, more successful? And certainly the feeling from business leaders, and we talk to 800 organisations globally and here in Australia, is that if you're not getting into this area of artificial intelligence, then the, um, your competitiveness, you know, globally and locally, you, you may actually find that you, you lag behind. Is that right? And, and so off the back of that then, from the, the, the companies that you speak to, particularly here in Australia, mm. is there an understanding of that very point, that you know, they need to be embracing, or at least looking at the opportunities you know, that, that new technologies like, like AI can bring? Because if they're not, there's a good chance some of their competitors will be. Absolutely. And uh, the same study, um, leaders were feeling that if they're, if they're not there now, in the next three to five years, they're going to be investing significantly in AI technologies. Uh, and in fact, one of the people on the panel that was uh, at Gartner with me yesterday said, you know, if you're, if you're not there, you're not going to be anywhere. So you are going to miss out. Uh, so there is rivalry and there's competition about, you know, either you need to keep up 
or you need to be a first mover. Uh, so we're seeing huge take up, you yeah. know, in these areas. A lot of um, experimentation, uh, a lot of proof of concepts, pilots, as organisations say, okay, well, how is this going to work? Because it is, look, it, these are technologies that will uh, augment current workforces, augment current court capabilities. Uh, you know, how's that going to work in our organisation? We haven't had the opportunity to have, work alongside robots uh, before. How's that going to work? And does that also lead into the idea of the productivity? Because a, a lot has been made of the idea of, of automation being a job destroyer. Mm. But I've read a few um, few articles that sort of equate it to the idea of um, you know, spreadsheets didn't get rid of accountants. They rather actually helped um, aid their work and allowed them to focus on other things. And, and people sort of equate that with, with AI and automation. It's not necessarily just blanketly getting rid of jobs, but rather just helping to empower those employees to focus on, on better sort of aspects of their role. Yeah, we think uh, jobs are going to change a lot. Uh, people actually don't particularly want to do the mundane, the routine, right. the boring, the unsafe things in remote workplaces. Uh, so we think there's going to be opportunities for people to get into more creative thinking, innovation, these spaces. So there, it's not to say there's not going to need to be relearning and training uh, in those areas. And certainly the feedback we're getting is that people who are leading organisations are more optimistic than these technologies are going to add to, as you say, make organisations more productive, perhaps with the same workforce rather than less. Uh, people in organisations can still be a little bit sceptical. We have to acknowledge that this is a big cultural shift. Yeah. It's a change programme or a change initiative. Uh, and so there needs to be ways that we can demonstrate to people who are working in businesses about what the benefits are, how your job could change. Um, and then you think uh, about industries in Australia. We've got some pretty harsh industries, it, you know, work in remote places, out the back of the Pilbara. Uh, not everybody wants to do their job there. If you think of how a robot could help in that environment, uh, improve uh, well-being, uh, safety, um, there's a massive opportunity. And for more business reaction to the ever-evolving new technologies, I spoke to AJ Barita from Car Sales. We, we read this as an opportunity. In, in actual fact, in uh, March this year, we, we formally started a department for artificial intelligence, and that was quite a leap for us. Um, but we had to do it because we... Why? Why? What, what were you thinking? Well, we're, we're seeing in our industry that um, the, the, the whole automotive industry is developing really, really fast. We're not quite in, in the business of making cars, but the changes that happen to, to cars such as if they go autonomous, such as if sharing picks up, all of that impacts our business model. We, we today are a buy-sell business and as we, we, we continue to innovate, um, the ecosystem continues to innovate around us, we've got to make sure that our business continues to evolve in that direction. I see that as a bigger opportunity to make the business even bigger than it is today because you think about it, you sell cars every three years, but you use cars every day. Yeah. And the opportunity is enormous. Is it, I mean, how much, pressure might not be the right word, but how much focus does there need to be on having an understanding of what's coming? You know, what's next in terms of the technology that's going to be shaping the way that we interact? Yeah, um, and, and you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. And, and for us, um, st starting to, uh, to understand how the future may look and when the future may come, is really critical because that starts to inform us how much investment do we need to make in this direction. So uh, one of the things we're doing is uh, myself and one of my colleagues is going over to Silicon Valley to start to understand that, that ecosystem um, around mobility, um, to understand that ecosystem around um, um, all of the newer technologies that are coming out, not just in mobility, mm. more generally in the digital world as well, because you know, the technologies around AI might have an implication on how we can do business. Um, a really good example is, um, a small example, but a good one is at the moment, um, we have around 10% of data that's structured, and what then happens is we've been automating anything with structured data. The bigger opportunity is around the 90% data that is unstructured. Mm. And unstructured data is videos, images. 
We serve more images than possibly many other businesses here in Australia. I bet. And we are in 10 countries, so we serve billions of images a year. For us, to do anything with images manually is, it just isn't possible. But if we can start to understand what is inside an image a lot better, it can, it can really change the user experience we can offer to our consumers. As a really good example, um, we, we are developing technology and very, very close to, uh, to nailing this, um, the ability to recognize a car from its image. And, and this is something that wasn't possible. We've been trying to develop this technology for years and years and we weren't able to do it. What's changed today is the computational power that is available to us at the price is, is making it economically viable for us to, to delve into that field. Um, it's still in experimental stage, but quite advanced, and we're we getting accuracy up to 98.5%. And that is it for the program. Thanks for watching.